All right, so last time I had a really short talk about this tool, only 10 minutes. Today I prepared something a little bit longer because there's a lot of content to go through. Um, so we will do it in this workshop kind of a style where in the upper part of the screen I will have my slides in the terminal. In the lower part we will try out some commands. So can anybody read this font size? Um, yeah. Cool. So Task Courier is a CLI to-do list manager. And hopla. at the core, really, it's just a list processing program. If you would look into the, under the hood of the you know, car engine here, uh, you would just see a bunch of text files. So that's great. We can actually play with it, and we don't have to be worried about you know, getting, losing data in some sort of like proprietary format. And it's not only just that. It has like a lot of features. I kind of hinted that at that last session. So let's dive into it. But first. I always uh, kind of tend to start these talks without talking about myself, and then people wonder, OK, why are you even talking about these things? So that's kind of a thing that I want to address. Um, I'm a Linux user since 2012. So for some of you, it might, might not be so, so long. But uh, for me, it's a significant portion of my, of my lifetime. Um, that was back, I, mean, I started with Fedora when I joined Red Hat uh, in 2012 and uh, kind of got converted there to be a Fedora user. And uh, it stayed with me since. And Right now, I am CTO of Protein here, which is a computational drug discovery startup here in Toronto, and uh, which is proudly, I should say, say like 90% running on Linux workstations, even though kind of sometimes it uh, proves difficult. Um, and I'm speaking about Task Radio right now because it's been my kind of hobby project. Between 2014 and 2017, I've been kind of like heavily spending my like midnight hours hacking away. At, at this and you know, developing also some sort of uh, other tools and libraries that I'm going to be talking about today. All right. So why did I actually even start looking into this? Um, I'm all about like optimizing my daily workflows. I became, became infatuated with living in a terminal and I kind of you know, fell in love with the productivity that one can kind of reap in such an environment. And since command line is where I spend most of my day anyway, it's very easy to just do something like this. And uh, you know, anything, something comes across my table, I just write task add, do this thing, and I don't have to worry about it. Task query is going to take care of it. It's not going to do it for me, but at least I'm not going to forget. So this is a very efficient way of like, just quickly firing off tasks into my system. Um, I don't know how many of you have laptops or you want to try it out, uh, but I kind of like Try to structure it in such a way that you can follow along if you want. So you can install Task Warrior using your package manager. It actually comes prepackaged in many distributions. Um, so if you use any of these, uh, I'm, I'm hesitant to call this distribution, but actually Task Warrior works under Windows 10 as well, using Bash on Ubuntu. Um, you can use any of these uh, commands to actually get it running on, on your setup. So. Yes, these are different names of the packages. So the task is actually the name of the binary. And task warrior, some, some um, distributions like to package it under the full name of the project. So these are the same packages. All right. So first, let's jump into a very short demo of what task warrior is, such that you can actually get a feel for it. And I'm going to disappear from the camera here. Um, all right. So. In the beginning, this is going to be what you are going to see on your computers. You are not going to have anything. If you run the task command, we can see there are no matches. So let's add some tasks. Let's say we are going to I know, do some things around the house. So we have to clean the sink. And we have to, you know, I guess, throw out the trash. So now if I just run task again, I can see these are my tasks on, on, on my list. Um, you can simply list them using the task command, which is going to use the default report called next. You can see that in the, in the blue under, under my task execution over here. The task next, next what, what is what actually got executed. And we can see all those tasks. We can see that they are in a project called inbox. and. That is purely due to my custom configuration. I set inbox as the default project because I like to follow the 
getting things done um, framework. But Task Warrior itself is not actually opinionated about the way you use it. You can follow any methodology uh, when you're using, select, selecting your task. So let's say I came home and now I, I cleaned the sink. That's a thing that I like to do. And I just mark, mark it as done, just like this. So you can see I used the ID one. I could see it in the table, how to basically reference that task. And now um, I can see that I have only one task remaining in my pipeline. Um, now let's say actually my roommate threw out the garbage. I don't, I don't have to do it anymore. So that task is no longer relevant. Um, so we have to just delete it. So we can do task one delete. And it, we have to confirm, we say yes, and that's it. Now if we do task, we can actually see that there are no tasks available. Um, those tasks did not disappear though. They just went into different kind of a status. Um, their status was changed. And our default report doesn't show them um, because they're not actionable. So the, the way to use Task Warrior, really the power is in basically Task Warrior helping you to figure out what is the next actionable item on your agenda, like what you should do next. Uh, but I mean, the data is still there. If we do Task All, which is a different report, um, which shows all the tasks, we can see that those tasks are still there. They are just, uh, one of them is deleted, the other one is completed. And we can see some metadata uh, revolving around that. But that's a short demo. And we will dive into all the features uh, over the course of the, this evening. So basic anatomy of the task. What we have seen was a description of the task, and we talked a little bit about the status. So, um, so basically, every task, when we enter it, um, you could see it in a, I guess if we, if we scroll up here, um, previously, all of these tasks were what we call pending. They were actionable. And after I you know, completed some of them and deleted some of them, some, some of them they ended up non-actionable. I had to use the task all report to actually see them. And we can see that their state is deleted and, and completed. So, but description and status, although they are fairly basic, they're not the only attributes we have available. Um, there really is a huge richness to us being able to like annotate and add all sorts of metadata towards uh, tasks. So let's dive like, quickly through, through these options. All right. So tags, maybe you might be mo most familiar with that, are just words that you can associate with a particular task. And the way you do it is basically by using this plus and minus uh, syntax. So if you, when you're adding a task, it's very simple. You can just specify plus and some word, and the word is going to automatically become a tag. You don't have to define the tag up front. You don't have to do, do anything. It just becomes associated with the, with the task. If you want to remove the tag, you have to use something that we call modify command. So this is shortcut for, for modify, mod. And you have to reference which task. So in this particular example, it's a task number four. And we're trying to remove the tag home because OK, that's actually a wrong example. We should have removed the tag, tag work because, but let's say we are, want to water the flowers at our workplace. So <laughs> we remove the, task, the, the tag home, just to be clear. Um, and there's no limit to the number of tags you can associate with a given task. You can have as many as you want. Actually, that's demonstrated over here because we added two of them to this task accidentally. Now, the next thing that is useful is project. And mind you, you don't have to set either task or projects. You can set both. There are some people that are purely like tag users, and some people are purely project users. And this is the way um, uh, you do it. So equivalently, instead of using the plus home tag, in this particular case, we define a project, which is called home. And the important kind of confusion point here is that really there is no project that is being you know, defined before where we state home is the project. Really, a project is just an attribute on the task itself. So it's just a pure plain text car field in your SQL database. Um, nothing more fancy than that. Um, you can also have what we call subprojects. And you do that via dot syntax. That kind of helps you in a sense, for example, if you want to filter for all of the 
projects related to your home, and you might have multiple sub-projects, you can just filter for project colon home instead of you know, having to do project colon home dot kitchen or project colon home dot, I don't know, something else. Um, so that's the use of it. It helps you, I guess, access the hierarchy. Um, but there's nothing more to that than that. All right. Now, getting into the you know, setting priorities. If you're trying to do any you know, task management system, systems, you can easily relate that the list of tasks can get longer and longer and longer, and you know, it never gets shorter. So you have to prioritize. And uh, the way to do it in Task Query is, for example, just setting a priority. Um, priority is a what I call enumeration column. So you can basically specify values H, M, or L, um, or you can just keep it empty, not specifying anything. And these priorities are going to then bump the urgency of the task. And we're going to talk about the urgency a little bit later. All right, now annotations. Annotations are a useful, versatile way how to associate more metadata with your task, like a free form text that you basically just put there as a note. Um, in this particular example, I have a shop that I, where I exactly want to go buy the milk uh, that my girlfriend likes. And uh, you know, I want to make a note that I really go there. So I'm going to annotate my task in order to make sure that I have that information available. And there could be, again, any number of annotations captured along with the task. All right, um, dates. Dates are actually where Task Query really shines. It has a bunch of different dates. And I guess in this section, I'm going to just like give you the overview of what these different date column means and uh, how can we leverage them. So the due date is pretty, pretty simple. Um, it just specifies where the task should be completed. If, if we, the task is still pending after the due date, it's considered to be overdue. And uh, there are certain penalties associated with that. Um, now we have scheduled date. And that kind of means, what is the earliest date where I can actually work on this task? Like, for example, I'm going to make a task that I want to congratulate somebody on their birthday um, or, or buy a gift. It doesn't really make sense to do it three months up front or seven months up front. Maybe buying a gift would make sense. Let's say congratulation only, sending a postcard or something. Um, I want to just have a reminder maybe a couple of days before. So I will set the scheduled date maybe five days before the birth date actually happens. That way, I know this, this task is not, not actionable until that point, And I don't have to worry about it. Um, it still appears on a task list, though. So this second kind of a date called wait date is more, I guess, um, harsh on the user. When you set a wait date, the task actually disappears from your task list until that date. So if I set it to the, let's say, end of this year, for example, set my New Year's resolutions, um, I'm not going to see the task until the New Year in my task list. It's going to be still there, but it's not going to show up. And then there's a special kind of a date, which uh, means that uh, you have kind of messed up, and you have not fulfilled your task, and the task is just irrelevant. Like you just completely forgot to congratulate your friend on, on their birthday. And it's going to be kind of you know, stupid if you congratulate them like a week later. So like, you might want to set an until date on that task that is like a week later after their birthday. At that point, the task makes no longer sense. Uh, and what Tasker is going to do for you when that date is reached, it's just going to delete the task from your task list. It's still going to be you know, buried in the deleted tasks, but it's not going to be showing up anymore. So I said uh, task query is powerful with the dates, and it's true. Yeah, go for it. Sorry. Uh, is the until date actually uh, set differently than done, for example? Like, if I had you know, uh, congratulate my friend on mm -hmm. November yeah. And I don't do that. Does the until date at November 15 says, well, you've already it's already expired, but and you haven't done it, or is it just that you just set it up as just it's, a, it's done? Okay. Well, I mean, I have talked a bunch. Maybe we should just have an example. Okay. Um, so, let's. So the question was, uh, how 
different is the way of setting the until date from setting the, all the other dates. And I cannot offer to demonstrate an example to make things more clear. So let's uh, take this particular example of uh, send a birthday card to my friend. All right, and let's say their, their birthday is on, I don't know, um, hopla. Let's just, OK, whatever. Um, <laughs> some of my reminders over there. So let's, let's set it to, let's say, two days in, in the future. Um, so this is how we do it. You basically specify an attribute by mentioning his name, then putting colon, and then you put the date there. Um, all right, so we can see it. Right, it's over there. We can see that it got a different color, and that's because uh, task query thing is quite urgent. It's in one day, actually, um, more or less, rounded down. Um, so if I were to actually set the until date, for example, uh, the way I would do this, I would do task one mod, and I would just say until, let's say 2019, 11, 20. And after 20th, this task is no longer relevant. Um, it still shows up right now, um, but I think that is what we could do. I could just um, set a fake time. OK. So let's, let's try this. This should work. OK. So 2019, 11.24. OK, this is a good time, right? Uh, do task. Oh, look at this. Um, looks like I failed to send birth birthday cards to my friend, and uh, it's, it's been deleted. So the task actually no longer shows up. Um, so all of these dates are just set uh, in, 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 in this manner. Like, Let's say we had a different friend who has birthday 14th of December. For that one, I could just uh, modify it to, for it to wait until, I don't know, 2019, 12, 07 or something. And now I can see that the task no longer shows up, even though it's still in a system. And I can see it's in the waiting state over here. All right? Cool. Um, maybe there are some other things. Sorry? Oh, you want to get a microphone. All right. So we have a question from the audience. Um, the question I was asking is, will it show up in like the, the, the task lists all as a task that has been completed versus a task that was missed? Like, um, so okay. after the due date, yeah. which you're yeah. now, the task is now irrelevant. Yeah. When you say task all, mm -hmm. OK, uh, will it come up as a completed task, or it will be a deleted task? I see. Yeah. I see. So we can see it over here, right? It's uh, this is the task that we that got auto destroyed. Um, it got deleted. We can see it over here. The D here me means that it's deleted. Mm -hmm. C over here means that it's completed. Yeah. So yes, it uh, marks it as, as deleted. So we, you can kind of determine that that you failed at that because it got deleted. Okay. Cool. All right. Um, we're going back to some of these things. OK, I, I don't think I have to demo these commands. That's pretty self-explanatory. I have a lot of stuff to go for. So dates, since they are so important to do workflows, um, Task Warrior supports a lot of ways of setting them and, and specifying them. And the way I've done it, you know, year-month-date, uh, the day, not really convenient that much. Um, but that's like a universal way that always works. Um, you can specify you know, the ISO 8601 uh, style timestamps. Um, feel free to, to do that, but I guess even more inconvenient to type. Um, you can use these relative uh, timestamps that, that kind of change relative to when you are executing the command. So you can set something to do now or today or yesterday, or tomorrow, or even Friday. So Friday would mean the next, the closest Friday that is in the future. And when you are specifying the date, it uh, refers to the midnight of that date. So 00, colon 00, colon 00. Um, all right. So in the same way, you can also specify um, like a relative kind of day numbers or just uh, three weeks, one day, those, those things are always uh, meant relative to the now, um, um, I guess, 
point in the time. So let's say three weeks means now plus three weeks. Um, then you have like a bunch of uh, keywords that you can use to refer to different, um, I guess, work-related or life-related calendaric, I guess, milestones uh, would be the right word. Uh, for example, this stands for st start of the week, start of the work week, start of the month, start of the quarter or year. And in a similar manner, you have the end uh, version. So end of the week, end of the work week, end of the year, or things like that. Um, also, I mean, we're getting really feature rich here. You can specify like certain holidays, like Good Friday or, or Easter. Yeah, there's a question. Is there a way to specify second Tuesday of the month? You'd be surprised how difficult it is sometimes. Second to do. Tuesday of the month. Well, <laughs> um, just today by sheer coincidence. Actually, yeah, I, I don't think so. No, uh, we don't support that, but we do support date arithmetic, but it's not as clever as that. Um, so you can, for example, use any of those relative, I guess, arrows in time, like today or start of the week, and then you can add any interval to them. So you can say, for example, if there's something to be done by tomorrow 6 p.m., the way I would actually do it, I would just say tomorrow plus 18H, which stands for tomorrow plus 18 hours. And uh, that's, for me at least, the easiest way how to kind of like think about it. I don't have to like type down the actual well, you know, numbers of a long date format. All right. So we covered like the simple use cases and, and the simple attributes that we have associated with tasks. Um, but there are like more advanced ways of how we can edit the tasks in the, in the database. And uh, let me just like show you a couple of them. Um, all right, so let's uh, add some stuff. Let's say that we are going to organize a party. So we can call it the project party. And we first have to you know, get together an invite list. All right, um, and I've added this task. Like if, I, if I look at the tasks, I should see that um, this task has an ID 2. Can anybody tell me why this task has an ID 2 and not ID 1, as we have seen previously when we only had one task? You say in ID 1, there is already a task. Which task is it? The, the only one which is not deleted. If you put a task on. Uh -huh. I'm going to put task. There is a pending task. There's a uh -huh. Working. Yes, yeah, so, so is the waiting task, the one that we kind of, like yeah. The one that we hidden away, it's still there, so that's why it's still, it's still active, so it still has an ID. Yeah. Um, but we don't see it here, right? Because we are not supposed to be bothered by it. It's not, it's not relevant right now. Okay, so what I want to show you guys is, all right, let's try to edit this task. And editing is going to do the following. It's going to spin up a, your favorite editor as defined by the environment variable editor. For me, it's a Vim. And uh, you can edit any things about the, the task here. So we can, you know, let's say, add some tags. Um, let's say, I don't know, paperwork. Um, and uh, we can also say that this should be done here by 2019, um, 11, 14. And here, I guess, maybe this will work. I don't actually know. Um, OK. We can add some, uh, what can we add? We could, we could add some, some more dates, but we don't need to do that. Oh, yeah, let's add an annotation. That's what I was looking for. So um, make sure to invite Raul and Mark. It's going to be my annotation for this task. And I'm going to close this. And it uh, tells me that the due date was modified. So if I now do task two, info, I can see all the information about this task. And there's maybe more than you guys can chew right now, because you don't get a of, lot of these uh, other um, metadata that is, is being thrown at us. But what is important here is that we can see that this annotation here has been actually added. Um, and uh, the tag that we added has also been added. So this is like a nice way of like editing the task, I guess, if you need to make you know, changes on the fly, and you don't want to like compose a super long command line uh, command. Um, this is the way to do it. All right. Um, 
Now, if you want to annotate, you know, we talked about that, so also invite Lucas. Hoppla. Whoops. So I made a mistake. I did not specify a filter. You can see I didn't say which task. By default, that would mean that I want to annotate all the tasks that are in the database. So task query is like, hey, man, are you sure you want to do this? Um, and I'm like, uh, no. Uh, I should actually specify that this is supposed to be task two. And now it just went through without asking for a confirmation. Um, but let's, let's assume that I actually made a mistake. Lucas is not my friend. I, I, I forgot. And I can just do task undo to undo that terrible mistake. Um, and I can see that here is a diff between the tasks, the, the last state with that task and the previous state. Um, so the thing that changes here, even though this is confusing, it's just a modified attribute also contains the actual second. So that's why it shows as uh, red and green, even though it's the same date here. Um, but this, by stepping yes here, I will actually move this annotation. So if I now do task to info, I can see only this one is here, not the one about Lucas. So yeah, sorry, Lucas. Um, Lucas is actually my friend. <laughs> um, all right, so there is one more command that I want to show you guys uh, in this, I guess, uh, group of commands, which is called task purge. And that is an actual feature that I implemented in 2.6.0, which is not actually released yet. So it's a very hot feature, although it's been there, there for a year or so. Um, but purge is a command to actually completely, for sure, remove a task forever. So you have seen that tasks, task does not forget. It keeps the history of all the tasks that you have ever put into it. And sometimes you put some things you know, there that you wish you would not put there, like you paste your password or something like that. You know, um, or it just maybe be, are resentful against your past and you just want to forget completely. Uh, you want to erase something from your, from your past. So you would do it like this. Um, you would task and then you would specify the task and then you would say purge. Now, this is not going to work. The reason it said purge zero tasks is because actually I cannot purge tasks that are not deleted already. So it's an active, doesn't work. I have to actually use what we call a UUID. And you can see that in the column right next uh, to the status, uh, this guy. So let's say this, this uh, task was redundant or whatever. So I'm going to copy its UUID. And this is a short form UUID. And I'm going to say purge this task. And uh, task is going to ask me, even for one task, just a confirmation, are you sure you want to remove this? Because this is going to be gone forever. And I'm going to say yes. And uh, now if I do task all, the task is no longer there. And this is, this is the only way to get rid of your tasks. So it's like a, use it very carefully. Um, it's a, it's a, the only dangerous way how you can shoot yourself in the foot. OK, so I spoke about these identifiers, right? And uh, we really have two of them, the ID and the UID. The ID is just the number, the line number in the file called pending.data. Um, and we're going to go into the actual file structure of the tool. Um, but the UUID is like unique, permanent reference to the task. It's actually, I believe, UUID 4. And there's like a bunch of uh, versions of this universally unique identifier. And uh, it never changes. And you can't change it either. Unless, you know, it's all plain text files, so you can actually modify it. But uh, I didn't tell you that. And don't, don't try that. Um, OK, let me enlarge this. Cool, so we're getting to the urgency. And urgency is really, I guess, I think where uh, you know, the aforementioned power of Tasker to like, do some of the decision making for you uh, really like, starts being more clear. So in order to determine what is the urgency of a task, the task warrior basically looks at all the metadata that is available and you know, basically computes a linear weighted sum of certain terms. Um, for example, a priority. If we have a priority of h, the coefficient here that says that our urgency is gonna to, going to be bumped by 6. Um, if there is a due date that is like near or overdue, our urgency is going to be bumped by 12. And it's like linearly scaled in a, in a certain like um, interval before and after um, the due date. For example, if you have some tags 
the, I guess the assumption here is that you care about the task if you have some tags or, or, or annotations or whatever, so you have a higher uh, urgency, but only, only very slightly. Um, also, if the task ages, it has been like entered too long ago, it also like grows in urgency, but only up to 2.0. Um, if you already, for example, set the task as active, which means that you said that you started the task, it's going to get bump of 4. So these are like the things that you can tweak in your configuration file in order to you know, make sure that you prioritize um, properly. For example, here, this is like a very convenient one. The next tag, you can just like tag something as the next thing, and it's going to get a bump of 15. So it's like a really powerful bump. Um, oh, hey, one more thing. Uh, you can actually see that some of these guys are negative. So you can also use certain features of the, of the task to um, lower the priority. And actually, the priority L coefficient is like highly disputed in the uh, task developer community at some point. It was like, well, should L actually increase the priority, or should it like go below? Should it be negative, because it means that it's like less, less important than like the task where I didn't bother to send the, set the priority at all. So yeah, it's 1.8. I would actually, I personally myself set it to negative, um, because that's how I feel it should be. All right, so let's get to some more fun stuff. Filters and reports. So kind of have implicitly sh kind of touched upon that a little bit. Um, but almost every task command accepts a filter. So filter basically means a query, which is going to subselect a set of tasks for you. And the second thing which usually comes is a report or a command. Command would be like add, mod, things like that. A report would be things like next or all or list. Um, and all of these reports have their associated features. That's why we have uh, plenty of them. And you can actually define your own. Um, and we're going to go into more of that. But in the example here, let me maybe just demonstrate that. Um, we can see that the last line of, of, over here uses the completed uh, report. So if I, for example, do task completed, I'm going to see all the tasks that were marked as done. Right? If I look over here, I can see the only, only guy who was marked as done is this guy. Throw out the trash. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Clean the sink. I'm blind. Um, yeah. So that's why it shows up. The, the completed fil uh, report has a default filter that filters for the completed tasks. Basically, OK. So how can we actually specify filters that are more powerful than just pure, I guess, selection or pure equality? And this is the way to do it. Um, for example, if you want to see all the tasks that are due before the end of the month that are not low, low priority, you would combine these two, uh, I guess, attributes with respect to what we call attribute modifiers. So um, this is like a nice syntactic sugar uh, feature where you can basically use all of these words here to alter the meaning of the query. Um, so for example, the other ones that you could use are, for example, not just before, but after. Or you can say um, contains. So for example, you could say task description dot contains birthday, and you would get all the birthday related things or things that mention birthday in their description. Um, all right. The other even more powerful thing that you can do is you can start building these filter expressions, uh, which allow you to actually build, build arbitrarily complex Boolean-like expressions that use even the attribute modifiers inside of them. So in this first example over here, this is the same thing that we had on, on the last slide, if you remember, uh, due before end of the month, priority not uh, low. The same thing of doing that using a expression would be, OK, due is less than end of the month, and priority is not equal to low. Um, we have to put it into the brackets um, because of some issues that I'm going to get towards later. But for example, for this guy, we could negate the whole thing. So we could say, give me all the tasks that are not project and are not garden. So instead of doing not this and not this, I can just say not this or this, right? So basic Boolean logic here. And you can leverage that in Task Queer as well. Um, 
I guess what is important here is that um, the equality sign does not actually test for precise equality. It's just approximate equality. And the reason that is important is because, for example, you want to say, give me all the tasks that are due on Friday. And you don't, you don't actually mean Friday at midnight. You mean Friday 2 PM, Friday 4 PM, as well as, as uh, Friday 8 AM. So for example, on dates, uh, the two dates are equal if uh, you know, the actual, only the date part is equal. The hours and minutes are ignored. And if you want to have exact equality, you just use double, double equal signs. OK, so I mentioned that the uh, reports have filters associated with them. And uh, if we were to actually look at the report called list using a command called task show, task show is used to uh, show a configuration settings. Uh, in the task query, we would see this. So maybe let's have a look at that. Let's, uh, let's make sure that I'm not actually telling you some things that are not true. So OK, that's not the exact output, but uh, I got it right, at least uh, from that perspective. So this is the configuration variable, and this is the, its, its value. Um, what if we were actually interested in seeing how a whole report is defined? So we can just do show me everything related to report.list, and I would be able to see that, OK, this report.list um, has all these columns. Um, so these are the columns that I want to have listed. It has a description. It has a default filter that is being applied. And uh, there are a bunch of labels. And also, this is important, how the list should be actually sorted out. So first, it's sorted according to the start attribute, which is only set for tasks that you have set that you have already started working on. And in, I guess, this is decreasing order, due date in the increasing order, and project, I guess, alphabetically, and urgency in the decreasing order again. Um, so if I were to do the task list, you can see that um, it has all these columns, but only if any of the tasks in the list actually have those columns. So for example, we don't have priority right now, OK? Right, because we didn't, didn't set a priority for this task. You can see there is no priority being outputted here. If I were to modify um, the task and set its priority to be low, and I would task, do, do task now, I can see, OK, there's a new column here, priority. And uh, it's set to low. So task is kind of smart about that. It's not showing us like redundant columns if they're not like, relevant to the set of tasks that it's supposed to be displaying. OK. So now we're getting to what I kind of um, talked about in the, in the beginning, which was uh, basically the combination of uh, the filter and the default filter of the, of the report kind of gets merged in the insides of task warrior. So if I do task project colon home list, it actually means task status pending project home. And that's the actual filter being applied to the task database because the default filter for the list report is pending. I think that's uh, clear to everybody. I, I, um, if, if you guys have any questions, please feel, feel free to ask. But it's like the vibe I'm getting is that I'm belaboring the obvious. Um, all right, so I want to go into the configuration a little bit. Um, the configuration is present in the task RC. Hopla, wrong window. Um, in the task RC file. Um, so here you can see. I can set a bunch of things, and I'm going to just go over some of the things that you can already understand. You can set your color scheme. I have it set to salarized. You can set your like, weeks, like start of the week. Um, you can set a default project. For example, I like to have the inbox as my default project without me having to set it. Uh, here are the things that you set as your urgency things. I just set a bunch of things to zero. Um, oh yeah, here you can see I actually did do have the um, priority L set to minus two. Uh, I was kind of unsure about whether that's the case. Um, yeah, and there's a bunch of settings. Um, I'm going to go into more of these. Um, for example, here I override the settings for the next report. I say that I only want to see 20 tasks. So I have modified the default uh, filter to only limit myself to 20 tasks at a time. I don't want to see like 60 or 90 or 100 if I have too many. OK, I'm going to get some of these other settings um, in due time. Um, all right. Yeah, so we can do also things like define your own holidays. 
in there, which I don't actually do myself. I don't actually pay attention whether it's a holiday or not these days. Um, and you can turn certain features off and off, on and off. All right, so <clears throat> I promised you guys I'm going to give you more insight into how Task Player looks and works under the hood. And uh, let's just do that. Really, all the data is stored in four files, completed data, pending data, backlog data, and undo data. So let me just have a look at that right now. Um, for that, I need to go to the .task folder, which is where the, all the data is stored. And I can see these are the files, um, just a bunch of plain text files. If I open, let's say, the pending the data, I can see this is it. It's a one line per task. Um, it's not any standardized format. Unfortunately, it's a, um, I guess, fourth version of this uh, data file format. Um, um, but it closely resembles JSON. And Taskware can export and import tasks in JSON format as well. Um, and you can see there's a bunch of fields um, separated by space. Um, in a similar manner, uh, the completed data is all the tasks that are completed or deleted. Um, from, the, from for that matter. OK. Now, let's have a look at the undo data. And that one is from it, it's like a kind of capturing uh, all of the changes in, in time that we did. So this one actually grows um, as much as you use Tasker. And at some point, it's fine to like just delete a bunch of stuff here or just remove it completely if you are OK with just losing a history of, of modifications. Um, and then the one that is important as well is called backlog data. And that one is important for syncing. So that one contains all the changes, also with the timestamps when they happened um, to given tasks. And this allows us to actually synchronize our local task query database with task query databases on different computers or even on your phone. There's a, um, there was a bunch of attempts to, to do I don't like Android apps for task query. Um, Actually, also works on Termux, which is like this Android app that you can use to have a terminal on your phone. Not very convenient, but if you have a Bluetooth keyboard, you can use that. Um, all right, so this is it, really. Like, there's no, like, it's all here. You can modify any of that, and Taskware is not going to crash or anything. We can actually try it. I mean, don't try this at home, but uh, let's 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 do it. Um, um, I'm just going to add one more person here, and if I look at this. I can see this annotation has changed. So there's no, there's no checksums or anything like that. Uh, you don't, you're not going to corrupt it by uh, modifying it directly. Um, so be, be careful if you do it. I mean, it's not recommended. You don't, you don't need to. Um, all right. So now <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit about the garbage collection. So Task Courier really is uh, all about performance. Um, it's written in C++, actually. Um, even though it's a very simple uh, command line tool, and there's like a rigid set of benchmarks that are being executed on every release to make sure that the performance of the tool doesn't go down if the like, task career, like, if your set of tasks is like thousands, that you can still be like fast and, and quickly filter tasks and you don't have to wait for uh, the command to execute because we all know that it can be annoying on the command line if you have to wait a couple of seconds. Um, so what task career does in order to kind of improve its speed is what we have seen. It separates the tasks that are still pending from the tasks that have been completed. And the assumption here is that um, you're going to execute more filters against the tasks that are uh, pending than the ones that are completed. Um, so actually, Task Warrior and its insights, when it's evaluating the filter, it uh, figures out whether it needs to source the tasks from the completed database. And if it doesn't, it doesn't actually touch that file at all. It only looks into the pending the data. Um, so what we call garbage collection is really this operation that moves the tasks from the pending data to the completed data. And by doing that, it actually changes the ID numbers of, those, of the tasks that still remain in the pending data. So it changes the IDs. And that is an important thing to kind of keep in mind that the ID can change if the garbage collection would happen in the meantime. But the garbage collection is by default turned on and happens with like every command. So unless you have explicitly turned it off, you don't need to worry about this. Uh, only you, want, you, want, you might only want to like turn it off if you're like performing some kind of batch tasks, and then you want to, I guess, garbage collect at the end. Um, so that's more for the people that are doing scripting, but I kind of wanted to 
I guess, explain what is happening with the IDs behind the scenes. Um, all right. So I wouldn't, wasn't sure exactly how much time I would have to get into the more intermediate and advanced topics. Uh, so I kind of just like made a list of these. And we still have some time. So let me just quickly breeze through what is out there still for you to explore. Um, we already touched upon the custom reports. So the way you do this, you basically go into your task RC file. And you could just copy this and create a new report to be called, I'd say, um, mine, and we could just have this to be all the pending tasks that say something with what? Let's say project work. Okay, that's a bad name for the report. Then let's change this to work. Okay, and let's say all the other things we want to keep the same. Um, so now if, now if I do task work, I have no matches. I don't have any uh, tasks in the project work, but let me just add, add some. Um, let's say, I don't know, plan the next sprint. And this is project work. If I do task work now, I can see it's there. And if I do just task, um, both of my tasks are available. OK. Um, recurrence. Recurrence is a neat way of actually having tasks that recur in time. Um, so we can do. A recurring tasks, um, for example, let's say we need to, um, yeah, let's, let's, let's take the one that we had before, right? Uh, throwing out the trash. But this time, we say let's uh, do end of the week. And we want to, for this thing, actually recur weekly. So we create a task four, and you can see it says it's a recurrence template. So it's going to use this task as a, as a reference as to what kind of tasks it should generate each week. Uh, so now if I do task, I can see that actually it generated a new task called throw out the trash, which is, uh, uh, which is due in five days. And uh, I can see it's a rec recurring task on a seven day interval. All right, and you can set different recur recurrence intervals, so weekly, monthly, you know, daily, uh, for habits if you like. Um, and you can associate all sorts of metadata with that template task as well. Like you can put tags, tags in it, and it's going to be all copied into the child tasks that are being generated. Um, time tracking. So we mentioned active tasks at some point. Um, what Tasker allows you to do is <clears throat> basically set that some things are already underway. So I would say task free start if I started to plan my next sprint. And yeah, Tasker kind of complains about it. It says like, well, you, were, you had some more urgent things to do. Why are you working on this plan the next sprint if you are supposed to throw out your trash and get together in whitelist? And both of these things, according to my metadata, are more urgent than doing this task number three. But it's just a, a nag. It doesn't, doesn't do anything, so you can ignore it. Um, so you, you probably want to have a deferral on um, week. You probably want to have a week on throw the trash. Yeah, we could do that because maybe it's a thing that we only want to do on a weekend. So we could just uh, do task modify um, task number four and five because four is a template. Uh, let's modify them to wait until. Um, end of the work week, OK? And uh, I'm saying yes here. And now if I look at the task, it's not actually there. So now my most, most urgent task is actually the one that is actionable right now. Um, virtual, OK, sorry. On the topic of time tracking, I should also mention um, what it really only does in the task query itself is that if you do task, um, um, which one was it? Um, yeah, task free, right? Task, task free info. We can see that it start. It says the start attribute. Uh, so the only way, basically, I see the start and end of this task um, is through this info command, right? I can see what the duration was, but task free doesn't really have a too much time tracking functionality built into it. The reason is because there's a 
is, is, is that is, there's like a separate project completely dedicated to you tracking your like billable hours or the hours that you spend at a particular task, and that, that one is called Time Warrior. So I also kind of uh, encourage you to explore that one. I don't really have time to uh, explore Time Warrior today as well, but it's a tool built in a very similar manner. Yes? It is, and it is related. It's related, and it can be integrated via, t via integration interface called Hooks. So Task Warrior actually has Hooks. I'm going to speak about it in a couple of minutes. Um, OK, virtual tags. Virtual tags are actually the things that we kind of see here. Each time I do info, you can see that each task has a bunch of virtual tags associated with them. And these are not actually physically in the file. Like if you were to open the pending the data, you would not see them. These are like auto-generated on the fly based on the properties of the tasks. So for example, uh, one of the virtual ta tags is today. So instead of doing do today, I can just say plus today. And okay, there's nothing to do today. Um, and give a talk on Task Warrior do today. Okay, well, you can see this is basically do 20 hours ago because today by default means midnight. Um, I could also do task six modify do today plus I don't know 20 hours. And now it's only overdue 36 minutes. Um, yeah, so there's a bunch of these uh, virtual tags um, that you can use. Um, and uh, some of them are useful. If we look into, into a manual page uh, and we look for the virtual tags. Uh, all right, here they are. Um, all sorts of like properties being basically easily queryable through the tag. Like for example, if it's in this quarter or in this month or whether it's overdue or whether there's a child task. Um, no, that's actually deprecated. Um, whether it's annotated, whether it's active, you can use these tags to like quickly filter. Um, all right, now into some of the advanced topics to give you more uh, juice. First of all, there's Task Server. Um, so it's a also related project in the ecosystem uh, that is being maintained. It's called Task D, uh, the binary, and. Task Warrior is able to synchronize using uh, Task Server using the command Task Sync. I don't have Task Server configured right now, so it's not going to do anything. Um, but there are also even just Docker images available on the internet that you can use to spin it up. It's uh, relatively simple. Um, it communicates over TCP with TLS, so we've got to set like certificates on, on both sides. That proves for some users a little bit tricky, so we get a lot of questions about it, but uh, we have very good documentation on how to do it. Um, context, a very useful feature, and I don't say that only because I implemented it. Um, yes? Uh, <clears throat> is it possible to uh, set up task D with SSH, just SSH? Um, not that I'm aware of. Um, oh. Just SSH, uh, the task D runs on like a dedicated port, TCP port. Um, I mean, I guess you could use SSH port forwarding in order to do that. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking along the way of Git. It's like a lot easier to set up Git server if it just everything works through SSH. Yeah, um, so that's one of the flaws of the current, uh, I would say, feature-rich um, set of things that we provide. Kind of. So that's not available, sorry. I mean, um, the, I guess, task square itself, a little comment on that is like almost a decade old. I'm not even the main person behind it. I'm just like one of the, I'm number three, but there's a very huge number, very huge gap between the number one and the number two, which is like 9,000 comments and at 200 something comments. I have like 207. Um, so the, the main developer, um, Paul, is uh, behind it. And at some point, it just became kind of overbearing in the sense that we would get much more feature requests than we could kind of handle ourselves. So the tool is kind of trying to have like a, a healthy balance between what it provides and what the development team can man maintain uh, long term. Cool. So context. Context is a very nice way of basically, I find, found myself at some point, I was, I was at work and I would be always just like setting different uh, filters and I always would say project colon work and some stuff next to it. And I was like, oh, wouldn't it be great if I could just say I'm at work. I only care about tasks that are work related. So don't show me all these tasks that are home related. Uh, so what you can do, uh, you can 
specify a context in your task RC file. And I actually have some contexts over here, I believe. Um, yeah. So I have two contexts here. One is project column PQ, which stands for the name of my startup. And one is next one is personal. Uh, I guess I call it context home. And I have alias the context subcommand to, to add. So I can actually just say task add, um, I believe it was uh, home. Damn. Um, and now, if I do task, I can see I don't get any tasks uh, listed. And that's because the default filter that is being applied is personal, project personal. And if I do task all, still no matches. Uh, I'm not going to get rid of the context now. I have to say task context none. Because now if I do task all, I can see there are no things of the project personal. So let's, I guess, modify some of the things. Maybe this last task. Let me show off a, let me show off a virtual tag, dot late, uh, plus latest, which is very useful sometimes. If you just add a task and you do the plus latest, you know it's like the latest task that you added. You don't have to look up what its ID was. Um, and let's modify this to have project uh, personal. So now I can see it, right? I, I can see all of the other things. But if now if I do task at home, because I'm at home now, and I do task, I can see, OK, these are the only home-related tasks that I have. And no matter what kind of report I do, even if I do work focused report, I'm not going to so see uh, those tasks because this filter project column personal is being applied. Um, caveat here is it's only being applied to uh, read only tasks. If you add a task, it's actually not being applied. There's a subtle reasoning behind it. It's because you can put like project personal or project work into the context filter, and then if you're adding an expression, uh, adding a task, you, can't, you don't know, OK, so is it project personal or project work uh, if you had an or in there? So um, that's the reason why we don't support that in the addition. Even though one of the issues in the pipeline is to maybe, if the simpler is, if the filter is very simple, you could maybe just apply that modification as well. Um, OK, I have a little bit of time left, so let me go through this just from like a high level. UDAs stand for user defined attributes. So Actually, the priority was a user default. <laughs> it's a default user defined attribute. Um, that we, we were getting too many requests for, like, can you add this attribute? Can you add this attribute? It would be useful for me. So we just added a general framework for adding attributes. Um, and uh, I think if we were to do task show UDA, oh, yeah, we can actually see all the UDA related things. I, oh, I even have one example in my task, task RC file. At some point, I was trying, I was playing around with estimation. So over here, I have added a UDA for estimation, and I had it like have a bunch of values: quarter hour, half an hour, hour, two hours, three hours, and so on and so forth. And I would add different urgencies associated with those with those values. But you can have an attribute for whatever. It could be a, in this particular case, it's a string attribute. So you could just have any string values in there. And you don't even have to enumerate them. I only did that in order to be able to assign the urgencies there. OK? DOM. Um, so Task Warrior actually has its own DOM, which is very useful when you're scripting. You can do something like task underscore get uh, six dot description. I think you have to be full, fully qualified here. Or six dot due date. And, you, and, and you're going to get a standardized reply as to what is the value of that attribute. So when you're scripting, you don't have to do like task six info grep do. Oh, that even didn't even work. Uh, I guess like this, then cut dash d, or maybe awk. You know, you, you don't have to do these like convoluted ways of extracting the values. You can just use the DOM. And um, that is a very useful thing when you're writing your own bash scripts that kind of automate the workflows around Task Warrior. Um, OK, hooks. All right, so hooks allow you to basically um, perform a custom action each time a task is added or modified. And uh, I think that's, that's, uh, that's pretty much it. Um, there I might be wrong. There might be like two more uh, types, but I don't recall exactly right now. The way it works is that. Basically, a hook is a arbitrary executable script. Um, and I don't have any right here in, in here because I nuked the folder. But maybe I can go to my secret <laughs> backup 
Um, do I have anything in there? No. Um, but I have developed a bunch of hooks myself. So I can, uh, do I have them here? No, I don't. Um, all right, so let me just talk a bit, uh, about it a little bit. The way it works is that basically you are supposed to, um, in order to, yeah, I don't have internet. <laughs> okay, so that's not, not gonna happen. Um, in order to basically modify the task on the fly when you are adding it and having like a custom action associated with it, uh, you specify a hook. A hook is a executable in the hooks folder. So it goes over here, the task hooks, and has to have a specific name. So it should be like, um, for example, um, like I don't do this dot on modify as, uh, let's say, do this at sh dot on modify would be um, the way to specify that this is like an on modify hook. And the hook would get on its a standard input as a, in a JSON format all the tasks that are being modified right now. So for example, it would get task six, it would look like this. And uh, it can parse it and the way, and what it's supposed to do, it's supposed to output the modified version. So you can have any custom action associated with, with, with hooks. For example, one of the hooks that I did for myself, I didn't like the fact that the default timestamp was midnight. I didn't like that if I say do Friday, it, Taskware thinks it's Friday midnight, I, I meant Friday end of the day. So I modified the task each time in the hook basically by adding 20 hours to it or 22 hours to it. Um, and that hook is actually available on my GitHub if you guys want to have a look. Um, then two projects that I've been mostly involved with. Um, Tasklip is a Python library to access your tasks. So you can just do import Tasklip and it's very useful to develop your hooks in this. So we can do task clip dot task warrior. And then we have all the um, tasks available. We can just tasks dot all and we're gonna see these are the tasks. And we can like, you know, my tasks, I can just assign it and it's okay, give me the second task. And this is the, this one and I have like all the attributes in there. So I can just do this, t dot, you know, um, my own description, I think it should work. It's there, so we can basically completely interface all of your database through Python. And, uh, you know, you can also like use the filters and it'll give me all the project personal things. And it, it just works, like all of the things, uh, like the same way they work on a command line, they work for this Python interface. Uh, very powerful. Um, I basically implemented all of the functionality that is available for task is implemented for this interface. It was like my, one of my pet projects at some point. And uh, I just uh, went for 100% coverage of functionality. Yes? Does it re-implement task warrior or does it no, it just implement an API to the C++ code? Yeah, so the, the question was whether it re-implements the task warrior or whether it just provides an interface. What it does just reads the uh, output of the task warrior. So actually, task warrior is running under the hood. Each time I, I execute, for example, a thing here, tasks.filter project personal, actually, it calls the task command, and uh, the task command exports all its output in an, an adjacent format, and we read all of that uh, in task clip and then create uh, Pythonic objects out of, out of the output. Um, it's only possible because task warrior is so fast. That's why, that's the way it works. And, and in order to do that, we have basically, that way we have all the functionality. So all the filters work the same and everything works the same. All right. And then I guess as a last uh, cherry on the cake, I would love to show you guys uh, my favorite uh, project in the ecosystem that is, I guess, the only one from the ones that I have completely started myself from scratch. And that one is called uh, Task Quickie, which is a combination of uh, a Vim plugin called VimWiki and uh, Task Warrior. So Vimwiki is a, yeah, a plugin for doing wikis. So let's say we have a wiki called index.wiki. Um, okay, and the detection somehow didn't work there, but let's say this is, oh, wow. Damn, let's see that this worked. Um, cool. So the way to think about this is basically, um, this is a regular, let's say, um, Vimwiki file. Or you can also just, you know, 
or you can use the markdown syntax, syntax. but I think I have uh, right now in my settings um, this uh, WinWiki format, which is similar to MediaWiki. So let's say this is my project, um, I don't know, birthday party. And here I say, okay, I want to have, I want to celebrate my birthday. And I write a bunch of notes in here. I can put all sorts of context here because this is con content here because that's just a plain text file. But at the same time, I want to have in this place all the tasks that I need to do. I, I like the idea of having all the information available here. So why don't I just do you know, this thing? I call it tasks. And I say, OK, I'm going to use this syntax, which is going to make this recognizable by TaskWiki. Plugin. TaskWiki is a plugin, a Pythonic plugin in, in, in Vim. Um, and I'm going to say, OK, project should be I know, personal dot, dot birthday. Now, some clever Vim syntax features hit this away. Um, and I can just start any tasks, actually. I can say, OK, well, okay, I hope this is not, this is not broken. Um, I don't get the cake. Cool. And uh, OK. All right. Let's see if this actually worked. Hmm. OK, but something is broken here. Still have the contacts on? Um. Opa. Yes, it's the, it's the Murphy, Murphy law of, of things not working where they're supposed to. Um, but I think this might be actually broken for some reason on my computer right now. Um, let me think about this. Um, anyway, I have to, I guess, refer you to a um, ASCII cinema. I'm not sure you guys know, it's like a GIF, a site where you can record your terminal. And I've done a task wiki demo uh, there at some point. I can't. I actually show this uh, right now, I believe. But, uh, but the way it's supposed to work, uh, you, you would get like an identifier here. Um, and uh, you'd be able to interface with all of the functionality of Task Warrior directly through, through Vim. I'm not sure what is exactly going wrong here, but I don't have time to debug it uh, on the spot. Um, so guys, thanks for your attention. And if you have uh, any questions, feel free to shoot right now. <laughs> yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the whole Task Warrior ecosystem, like all the projects that are available? If it doesn't take too much time, and to see like what what things can we even do with them? Does this thing work? Like, is it possible to build something like a local version of a GitHub for project management? Um. um okay. Um, let me. In order to answer the question, I'm just going to host myself a hotspot. Um, so there's a bunch of projects available. And actually, um, on the website of, of uh, the Task Warrior, um, OK, let me just do this. Um, so on the website of Task Warrior, which, is, which I'm going to show you in a bit, there's a whole dedicated page to list all the projects that somehow are related to Task Warrior dynamically through like GitHub API, because there's like so many of them. We just got fed up updating that list manually. Um, there is a bunch of nice projects that, um, I guess, uh, have a web interface. So they allow you to have a web interface. One of them is called indie.am. Um, OK. It's a curse of live demos. I can't even get the internet working. Um, yeah, so there is the inthe.am, which is actually available without you having to host it. It's a website where you can create your own tasks, like server account. You just have to be content with them hosting uh, the content of your tasks list. I mean, I know the guy who is running it. OK, we have the internet now. Um, um, so he's, uh, I guess, trustworthy. Um, but uh, you, know, you should not take my word for these things. Um, all right, so if we go to tools. 
we can actually see, and I'm going to allow all of my scripts here, there is a huge, um, a huge list of tools. For example, there's Bug Warrior, which is interfacing uh, like GitHub, Bigbucket, and, and Jira, and track issues, and you can automatically source new issues that are assigned to you or assigned to other people, depending on how you set your filters and import them into Task Warrior. There's like a bunch of web interfaces, like Task Warrior web in, in, in the AM. I'm actually going to show you this one because this one is, looks really good. Uh, uh, my friend Adam did a really good job on this one. Um, so this is what you can actually get uh, by registering here. It provides you with like email integration and RSS feeds and integrates with Trello and calendar and stuff and can send you SMS messages, I guess. Um, I didn't actually try that myself, but people have very good um, reviews of it. Then there's a bunch of <coughs> attempts to have a Android apps. There's a plenty of associated um, like command line tools like task open, for example, if you put into your annotation a particular link, like HTTP link, task open is going to like flare it up. Just, you just do task space open and an ID of the task, and you're going to open that associated link without you having to copy things around. Um, this is, for example, a what I was talking about, um, an example of a hook that uh, somebody has developed to integrate um, for some time checking functionality. So it's, you can write some of these simple Python scripts, and people have done that a lot. Um, there's a VI-like um, interface to task task called, called VIT. Uh, sorry, it's not VI-like, it's Encurses interface. I don't have it running on my computer, but um, that one just got a huge rewrite a couple of weeks ago. Um, so yeah, there's a really, really, uh, I guess, rich, um, ecosystem. ecosystem. Not all of it is uh, up to date. Some of these things are just out of date because the whole um, thing is, has been going on for like almost a decade. So um, yeah, but we have kind of tried to make it kind of nice by putting ratings and numbers of stars and things like that in there so we can actually tell just in this list, you know, how relevant something is right now. And you can filter by the type as well, like the hook scripts, for example. These are all the hook scripts and so on and so forth. Okay. Uh, is it possible to do uh, task dependencies with Task Warrior? Yes, it is possible, uh, although the feature is a little bit unintuitive, um, so I chose not to explain it today. Okay. Um, it's basically the other way around. Like, um, you are, I'm not even going to try to explain, but like basically, basically you, if you try it, you're going to basically be surprised that you're specifying dependencies in a different way. You are specifying um, not what is depending on, yeah. I see, I don't even have, can like recall which no, way it is. This um, is a different problem. I'm just wondering yeah, but possible. dependencies are, are, are kind of tricky. Um, but Tasker tries to handle it, but I don't think it does like a perfect job of it. So a long, like a long wished for feature is a subtask capability. And we have dependencies, but we don't have subtasks, and it's not exactly the same. And people use dependencies for subtasks, and then they are upset, but it's not providing the same kind of a tool set. So yeah, that's on the topic of dependencies. I have one question. My question is like, uh, as a uh, system admin, how can we define the task to the users and group of users so that we can have control of it? Yes, so that is another thing which does not exist in the feature set of Task Warrior right now. So Task Server started with the vision of getting there. It still didn't get there yet. So you have users on a Task Server, but each user is its own individual entity, and you don't have a notion of uh, groups that can collaborate and like, co-own the task list. The task lists are, at this point in time, very much private to each user. Although that's a feature that I would love if it was implemented. So if anybody's up to it, um, you know, please. And I guess one thing that I did not say, and that was my last slide. Um, OK, I'll, I'll give you the, the, the question first. OK, synchronization. Yeah. Um, I have multiple hosts where I would like to yeah. have access to my tasks. What, what sort of back and forth integration is there? Clearly having UUIDs on, on the tasks means that there's some hope of being able to try yeah. and synchronize. Yeah. But where, where has it gotten to? 
So at least for this question, I can answer this fully implemented. So task server provides all of that out of the box. You just configure all of your hosts to be, I guess, pointing towards the same task server with the same credentials. And task server is going to make sure that your tasks are being synchronized in a way that doesn't cause conflict. So if you modify the task one and the, on this host, on the host A, and task one, the same task, and the same attribute to a different value on host B, the task server is going to resolve the conflicts by looking at which modification is the latest. And it's going to take that one, and it's going to distribute that across your hosts. Exactly. Yeah. So um, in that way, you can synchronize your tasks painlessly um, across the, all of your hosts. Yep. My question is regarding uh, the security aspect. Can we uh, synchronize it or desynchronize the process of all the tasks so that it cannot be uh, hacked or something like that? What are the uh, security aspects of uh, yeah, this so task work? Thank you. Thank you. Um, sure, you're welcome. Um, so from the security standpoint, the communication, as I mentioned, is happening over TLS. And uh, at rest, the tasks are not encrypted. So at rest on the server, tasks are stored in the same way they are stored on your local computer. So the assumption here is that um, the box is not hacked. The, the remote server is not hacked. Um, because if it is, you have more, more trouble than, than that. Um, locally, you can't encrypt your tasks right now, even though there have been attempts to suggest or even implement that feature, uh, but it never got until the successful merge into the, into the master branch. Um, yeah, so that's on the security standpoint of Task Warrior. All right, so if there are no other questions, uh, let me first say one, one, one more thing um, to kind of conclude all of this. Um, so you guys have seen that Task Warrior has a rich ecosystem. Um, the unfortunate thing is that it's a very mature project, and uh, it's been mostly, um, I guess, developed and maintained by one person, our, our friend Paul. And uh, as his involvement in the project kind of decreases over the past couple of, uh, like more than a year now, uh, basically the project is getting to a point where it's stagnating. And uh, we would love to have more people to come on board to help us with maintaining, just like reviewing a little bit of the code, maybe implementing like a feature, one or there. There's, you know, there's not too much work to do. There's only work that kind of scratches your own itch. Um, but it would be really helpful if, if uh, you know, people that are here in the room or people that are looking uh, through the you know, window of the YouTube uh, uh, viewer uh, would be interested in actually helping with the maintenance and development burden uh, of this project. Because it's a great tool, great environment, and it would be a shame for it to like, slowly deteriorate um, and bit rot. So yeah, that's all from my side. Thanks for the attention, guys.